A warm welcome to all of you joining us today. We are here to talk about this fabulous book, Get It Done, Surprising Lessons from the Science of Motivation that was written by the brilliant professor Ayelet Fischbach. Now, I'm fortunate enough to know Ayelet personally, and instead of giving you the boilerplate introduction, I wanted to start off with something a bit more personal. Uh, to be fair, I did warn Ayelet that I might make her feel uncomfortable, but she doesn't know exactly what I'm going to say. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have heard the saying, you should never meet your heroes. And I found that to be true until I met Ayelet. As a graduate student, I only knew of Ayelet. I knew she was an extremely prolific scholar. And when I say extremely, I mean more than 100 publications under her belt. I knew she was an expert on human motivation and that she won multiple awards because of her groundbreaking work. Then later in my career, when I became a professor myself, I got to know Ayelet when she came to Yale for her sabbatical from the University of Chicago. And I can tell you that to know Ayelet is to truly love her. In addition to being a brilliant scholar, she is also an incredible mentor, friend, mom, wife, and now also author. Through all of it, she makes it look so easy. And I suspect that's because she's actually practicing what she's preaching. She's also incredibly generous in sharing her wisdom. And I'm really excited to talk to her about her book today. And Ayala, I, I have to say, I found this book to be a must read. I found myself actually using a highlighter as I was reading it. And I go back to these highlights to reinforce would have learned. And you managed to make the, the science of motivation accessible without sacrificing the complexity and richness of this topic, which I think is really, really hard to do. And so my first question to Ayelet is, how did it all start for you? How did you start studying motivation? So first, Ali, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I, I, I'm touched and I, you know, I, as you know, the idea of writing a book, the, uh, the making the initial, like organizing uh, uh, my thoughts around it happened while I was at Yale uh, on my sabbatical uh, with you. And so I, I'm so glad that um, uh, that you like the book and uh, and that you like Love the book. Work and, and I'm happy to chat about it. I, I have been studying motivation for a really long time, for uh, my entire uh, academic career. And when I started it in graduate school by the end of the 90s, uh, that wasn't a popular topic. <laughs> uh, that was the time when uh, uh, few psychologists were studying motivation, behavioral economics uh, barely existed. That's another field that is very much into studying how to, to motivate people to do what uh, they want to do. Uh, but it was, it was interesting. And uh, I will say that in uh, like one of my early conversations with uh, your own uh, uh, Ravi Dao, we connected over uh, research and motivation. We did some work together, and uh, and and Ravi was saying uh, something like, "Okay, so like, what's next? We've already done that. Like, what what else can uh, the two of us uh, do together?" And I was. Uh, uh, responding with, uh, well, I, I don't think I'm moving away from motivation. I, I think that this is what I'm going to continue doing for for many years. And, uh, uh, and it, it, it was a funny conversation because I, I think that by the end of the day, we both uh, remain in the, in the field of motivation and you know, became motivation scientists. Yeah, that's so interesting. What, what do you find most challenging about studying this this topic um well there, there are the, the practical thing that in order to study uh, motivation people need to be motivated to to do something okay so uh, you actually need to to get to the person at the point where they they hope to achieve something they hope to to study, they hope to uh, eat healthier food, they hope to go to the gym, they hope to uh, save more money. I mean, it's often a, you know, finding that time in the person's life and mm -hmm. asking them the questions that's relevant for the thing that they are trying to do. Uh, you can't 
really use scenarios. Okay? You can't really ask a person, what would you do if you are uh, uh, well, uh, trying to get an academic degree or well, trying to get a promotion? They actually need to be uh, pursuing a, a promotion. Uh, so more of uh, you know, a challenge than, than it's uh, uh, hard to do. The other thing that I think is, is maybe hard for uh, all of us who are doing research in the behavioral sciences that uh, people have strong intuitions uh, about uh, our field. And I you know sometimes when I give a talk, I, I start with like testing this intu intuition. And I ask you know, how, how many people here believe that we only uh, use 10% of our brain, which of course is nonsense, uh, but people have strong intuition that this is uh, correct. Or, you know, I, I ask uh, how many people believe that rewarding a behavior every time that that you see it is better than only rewarding it on some of the times. And again, people have strong intuition that this is correct, that you need to be consistent with your rewards and they're wrong actually, inconsistent rewards uh, work better. But doing research in a field where people have strong intuition that they already know it all uh, has its own challenges. That, that's true. Although I would say that that makes your work that much more important, right? Because part of the things that I've learned by reading this book is, is exactly dispelling these, these intuitions that I myself had. Um, and one of the things you talk about the book that I found fascinating is that intrinsic motivation is one of the least understood concepts in, in motivation science. And, and I'd like you to kind of speak to how, it, how is it misunderstood and can you help us understand it better? Thank you. Yes, I would love to do that. Uh, intrinsic motivation is uh, what you experience when you pursue an activity as its own end. Okay? Uh, when partially at least you do it just in order to, to do it. Uh, if by the end of the day you wish you had a few more minutes in the office because you really want to do the things that, that you're working on, you are intrinsically motivated if you can't wait uh, uh, to go home, uh, then you are less intrinsically uh, motivated. Uh, why is this confusing? Well, it's confusing partially because we often use intrinsic motivation to refer to the absence of uh, uh, rewards, uh, uh, of in particular monetary rewards. Uh, and by that definition, if you need to get a root canal, uh, this is intrinsically motivating because no one is forcing you to, to do this, okay? like, uh, and, and certainly no one is paying you to uh, take care of your teeth. And so, you know, psychologists would never say that this is intrinsically a uh, motivating activity. Clearly, you're taking care of your teeth because there is some external goal that you're hoping to achieve, uh, but it doesn't make it confusing. And then within psychology, there are a couple of confusions uh, about intrinsic motivation. Uh, one is that it has to have a specific content. We discovered intrinsic motivation, and by we, I mean the field. I wasn't a researcher uh, back then. Uh, many years ago, when we discovered that animals will explore their environment, even when there are no rewards uh, to find. Uh, rats will just uh, explore the maze. And so researchers uh, were saying, oh, the rats are intrinsically motivated by their curiosity. And then we, as a field, became to believe that intrinsic motivation is the pursuit of curiosity. Okay, or either we're talking about the pursuit of a, a relationship or the, the pursuit of creativity. And, and all these contents tend to be intrinsically uh, motivating, but really anything can become more uh, intrinsically uh, motivating, which leads me to the other misconception, which is that activities are either intrinsically motivating or not. And, and I started with the example of uh, doing your work. And for the, the vast majority of us, doing your work is never just intrinsically motivating. It's not purely intrinsically uh, motivating. You clearly want to get paid, okay? Uh, nevertheless, we can ask how intrinsically uh, motivated you are uh, to do this. And, and once we understand that intrinsic motivation is a matter of degree, okay, is a matter of how much the thing feels right as you do it, okay, it feels like an end in itself, then we can allow goals that otherwise don't seem intrinsic, like, you know, doing a work or, or exercising or, uh, um, you know, uh, studying and, and, and things that you're clearly doing because you're also trying to achieve something else. 
also be uh, intrinsically uh, motivating. Yeah, and 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 so it's good that you mentioned exercise because I, I I see in the chat that a lot of people talked about exercise as a goal, and and I want to ask you kind of a follow up question. Let's say I want to uh, work out more, and that's kind of my goal. Is there a way for me to make working out intrinsically motivating? Yes, there are a few ways. Uh, now keep in mind that. Exercising is unlikely to be only intrinsically uh, motivating. <laughs> uh, and so we can make it more intrinsically motivating. And the more we do that, the better we are to persist. But we should not think that at any point, for most of us, it uh, will become something that we do just because we enjoy it, that there is no external uh, reason. Uh, so um, how, how do we uh, make exercise more uh, intrinsic? Uh, one way is to choose the, the workout that is uh, uh, fun, okay? that is uh, enjoyable. We uh, ran a study, uh, by we, I mean, uh, Kaylin Woolley uh, and I, uh, ran a study at the uh, gym here uh, where we uh, asked people to either choose their exercise while they were already at the gym based on how much they enjoy it or based on uh, how important it is for them. Uh, those who chose what they did based on enjoyment did more. They did more, did it for a, a longer of time. Uh, basically, uh, uh, we're able to exercise more uh, effectively. Uh, another thing is, is bringing some immediate rewards into the activity, which is a fancy way of saying, make it fun. Okay, so what makes it fun for you? Bring uh, uh, music, bring a friend, uh, uh, choose variety uh, or don't choose variety. Okay, well, explore your exercise with uh, the goal of bringing uh, fun uh, uh, to, to this. Uh, and, and we found that when people do this, when they bring the fun to their exercise, uh, uh, they are more likely to stick to it. And for you, exercising might actually be the time you get to watch that television show that you would never watch otherwise. And, and, and that's fine. Okay? They, you know, it, it's exercising plus uh, uh, watching trash TV, okay, for example, uh, uh, or you know, reading a book. Uh, uh, it, these are the kind of interventions that make it uh, uh, more likely to happen. Uh, then there's the habit interventions, uh, uh, which is to, to just make it part of your uh, routine, uh, uh, making part of your day, maybe do it with a, a friend, uh, basically build the, uh, the habit of uh, uh, exercising. It constantly requires some support. Okay? It's easy to lose that habit, but you know, to the extent that you think about it as something like this part of your life that is a good, that is a fun part of your life, uh, then it's easier to stick with exercising. Yeah. And I, I, I found that study really interesting because it's really, if you're having more fun, you're actually going to be better at, at doing it, right? You'll, you'll persist and you'll do it longer. So it's not about what is the most hardcore exercise or the most efficient way. It really is about having fun and, and, and therefore sticking and, and being better at what it is that I'm trying to achieve, which I think is, is very counterintuitive. Another thing I found really counterintuitive that you talk about is, you know, we, we all had to deal with a lot of uncertainty during this pandemic. And you talk about uncertainty in your book in, in, in a very fascinating way. You say that uncertainty in and of itself is aversive, but it can be motivated. So can you say more about why and when we should actually embrace uncertainty rather than kind of shy away from it? Yeah, and some of these, uh, I know this is uh, a funny concept where we, we try to avoid it, but we are uh, motivated when we are in an uh, uncertain uh, situation, which could explain why uh, uh, the more uncertain we are during uh, you know, this uh, era of the pandemic, the more we, we just like, buy a lot of stuff and, uh, and, and, and like try to do something to uh, uh, make us uh, feel more um, un sorry feel more comfortable during this uh, uh, uncertain uh, uh, time. Now uh, the reason that uncertainty is, uh, uh, is motivating, uh, there's actually a few reasons. Uh, um, one is that uh, uh, you just don't know if the reward, rewards are going to be there so you work harder and this is the 
the intermittent uh, uh, reward system where uh, if rewards are only being delivered some of the times, then people are working harder. Let's say if uh, I don't know if I'm going to get a bonus this year because of some years I get a bonus and on other years I don't get a bonus, uh, then I will work harder uh, even if there is no bonus, okay? Because I, I think, well, next year it's coming. Uh, the other reason that us suddenly is, is motivating is that uh, it, it often sees it seen as a challenge. Okay? We are challenged by the uncertainty. Okay? Uh, no, we, we don't want to uh, work hard when success is guaranteed, but we will work hard when we don't know if we are going to be successful. And, and the third reason, actually, the reason that uh, uh, we studied in uh, uh, the research that we did uh, uh, here, and this is with uh, uh, Lucy Shen, uh, is that uncertainty is, uh, is, is often like a game, it's exciting. Okay? We don't like to be in the uncertain state, but we like to resolve the uncertainty. And if you, if you think about uncertainty, it's a bit like the, the negative side of curiosity. Curiosity is, is a positive feeling. Okay? And, and curiosity is the, the process of resolving uncertainty, the process of discovering something in, in, in your environment, okay? And, and often it's like discovering whether I'm going to get a reward or discovering what is going to, uh, uh, to happen. And now just to give you an, an example of what I mean by uncertainty is to being a, like a state that is motivating, that you want to explore, you, you want to, you're curious about discovering what is going to happen. Uh, we did a study where we uh, asked people to, uh, uh, drink a lot of water, now, not too much so that it is uh, unhealthy and don't try this at home, okay? It's not good <laughs> to drink a lot of water, uh, but a, a, a safe amount. Uh, and in uh, uh, one condition for some of the people, uh, we told them that we are going to pay them $2 if they will do it. And for other people, we told them that we are going to pay them either one or $2 and that will be determined by a, a coin flip. Uh, and guess uh, uh, who drank more water? <laughs> uh, well, that was the, the group that uh, uh, was offered either one or uh, two dollars. They were curious to see how much they are going to get if they meet the challenge. And so more people uh, met the challenge. So just an example for how uncertainty translates into curiosity, which leads to more motivation. That's so interesting. I think we can all kind of reframe uncertainty in our lives, especially during this pandemic and see it in an, as an ally sometimes rather than a, our enemy, right? And, and a motivating force in our life. I, I sure know as an untenured professor that the uncertainty of getting tenure is very motivating. <laughs> So now I want to talk about self-control because I, I found the discussion of self-control in the book to be very, very illuminating. And you talk about how self-control requires that you first detect and then battle the temptation that can lead you uh, astray, but that detecting our, our temptation might be tricky. And I thought that was really interesting. So can you say more about why detection of temptation is tricky and what are some strategies that can help us with that. Thank you. So detecting a temptation is the first stage, the first phase in, uh, in overcoming a temptation uh, because most temptations in our everyday life are, uh, you know, it's unclear if they are temptation, okay? If we only do it once, nothing happens. It's not easy to identify, okay? If uh, I lose my temper just once, that's not going to ruin my relationship. Okay, if I, uh, I eat that cookie just once, that's not going to ruin my uh, diet. Uh, just uh, another uh, glass of wine is uh, uh, not going to uh, get me to drink too much uh, alcohol. It's really about accumulation. <laughs> okay, it, it's really about uh, uh, how much you uh, give in to the, uh, to the temptation. And that means that Often the, the trick is to identify this one instance, this like one time that you will uh, lose your temper as a, as a self-control problem. Often that's enough, just understanding that this one cookie, one glass of wine is a problem, is enough to get people to prepare to, to fight it off, to uh, prepare to... Uh, uh, to overcome uh, uh, the temptation. And, and so a lot of the, the work that uh, uh, 
people in uh, motivation science, including me, did was uh, about uh, how to, to help people detect that this is a problem, that this is not good for them. Uh, do you want me to give an example for that? Yes, because I found your technique super useful and I've been using it in my life ever since I, I read it. So I do want you to talk about. Uh, and so I hope that this is the technique that you are referring to, but I, I talk about using a broad decision frame. Uh, that is uh, considering several opportunities uh, to get there and, you know, to, to get the, your intuition about this, think about a seatbelt, okay, uh, not wearing a seatbelt uh, once uh, is really uh, not going to increase the, the amount of risk that you are taking in your life. Uh, but the reason that we always wear a seatbelt is that we are thinking about the accumulating risk about all the times that we are going to be in a car and uh, not uh, wearing a seatbelt. Uh, if we do the same thing for other potential temptations, it often makes it easier to, to detect a problem. And, uh, um, you know, in, in one study that, uh, uh, that we ran here, we asked people about all kinds of like these small unethical uh, behaviors that we will do at work, such as, you know, maybe taking off a supply home or uh, uh, calling in sick when you actually just need an extra day off. Uh, and when we ask people about the likelihood that they will do it just once, uh, then people say, oh, yeah, you know, I, I would do this. And then when you ask them about doing it seven times, they say, oh, like, no, like if, if there are seven times this month or this year in which I might be uh, tempted to call in sick, then I don't think that I will do that. Uh, what we did is basically having people considering several opportunities together in this broad frame and uh, that makes it uh, easy to detect a temptation. Uh, on the other hand, when people actively try not to see the temptation, then they choose to you know, just consider one time. Okay? It's why smokers, for example, prefer to uh, buy uh, one pack over uh, yeah. a whole carton, right? So, you know, one it, pack. Well, that's yeah. Can you share the example you talked about in the book from your own life about the cookie in the lunchbox? Because I, I really connected with that and being in that particular uh, scenario many times in my life. Oh, yeah. Well, this is uh, my, my weakness. So, um, no, I'm, I'm sitting in uh, uh, many uh, faculty uh, meetings at the University of Chicago, and we get these uh, uh, lunch boxes, uh, and they always have uh, a cookie, uh, like at the bottom of the, uh, the box, and I, I never intend to eat the cookie, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a long meeting, and, uh, um, and there is a lot, like, not a lot for me to do, uh, uh, and the cookie is kind of nice, and uh, uh, for, for many years, I... Uh, uh, could not resist uh, uh, the cookie. It was just just today, okay, just this meeting. I really had to create a rule, and rules by definition are very broad decision frame. And my rule is uh, uh, no cookies in uh, uh, faculty meetings. Uh, saying that, Ali, if you offer me a cookie any other time, I will take it. Right, because there's no rule against that. <laughs> <laughs> just not during faculty meetings. No cookies then. Yes. What would you say surprised you most about self-control? Um, that, that's a tough one. I've been studying self-control. That was the first thing that uh, got me into motivation science. So uh, I, I did my PhD dissertation on self-control. I would say the one thing that I think surprised me, although by now I've been thinking about it enough here, so it's, it's, it, by now it's in, yeah, that makes sense. Is that, uh, that self control can be automatic? It can be uh, uh, unconscious. Like we often think about self control as this like conscious thought process. Like we imagine like the the devil and the angel sitting on our uh, shoulders and then fighting each other when we are listening to their arguments. And 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 we realize that uh, early on the this is not how things really happen, that a lot of the self-control responses uh, is something that you practiced in your life and at this point is automatic. It's something like what I just described with the cookie that, you know, I, I don't really have a huge self-control conflict. I kind of, I, I see the cookie and then I remember, oh yeah, but like no, no cookies in faculty uh, meetings. So, you know, maybe I uh, 
see, and, and we saw that in studies that people activate the overriding goal. Okay, so maybe when I, I see cues for like social media, I think about my homework. Okay, or when I see cues for unhealthy food, I think about uh, the fact that I want to eat healthy and how, how much people can have this automatic response of when I see the temptation, I will think about my uh, goal. Right, right. And, and you talk about one, one way of dealing with temptation is, is pre-commitment. Can you speak about that? Yes, a pre-commitment is uh, basically when you uh, decide in advance that uh, uh, that you will not do something and you kind of arrange your situation so that it is... Uh, set uh, uh, in, in your favor, okay? So uh, uh, pre-commitment, uh, you know, the, the story that I give in uh, the book is uh, deleting someone's phone number, okay? Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, when you delete someone's phone number, uh, which means that you will not be able to get in touch uh, uh, with them because obviously uh, no one these days ever memorized anybody's phone number, uh, what you, you do is, is kind of, uh, you know, in a way it's, it's funny because why would you delete someone's phone number? You, you don't have to call them. Okay. Let's say that you're after a terrible breakup and you don't want to ever talk to this person again. Just don't talk to them. You don't have to delete their number. We delete someone's number because we think that in the future, we might have this moment of weakness where we would like to call that person. And so we pre-commit to not calling them by not having their uh, number uh, so uh, easy to find on our uh, phone. So it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, behavior that suggests that uh, uh, we often are our own behavior uh, uh, designer. Okay, we we influence our future self by uh, uh, pre-committing to uh, certain uh, set of behaviors that we uh, can possibly pursue. Right, and another example would be not to buy candy and have it in the house because if I'll have it, I'll eat it. So I'll just pre-commit to not having it, and then the you know the temptation is basically gone. Well, I I, I silence my I don't know if you noticed, but I silence try to do it very smoothly, but I silence my timer because. It is now time for us to take questions for the audience. Thank you so much, Ayala. That 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 has been very very fascinating to hear, and we're getting a lot of questions. So the first question that and and as I'm reading these questions, please feel free to ask more questions as well. We'll try to get to as many as we can. So um, the first one is: uh, I'm a director of teaching and learning center in higher ed, and I'm interested if you have insight into motivating faculty who have been through a rough two years, haven't given of themselves intellectually, emotionally, professionally, almost to or past their breaking point. How do we support them and bring them back to the professional development table? Yes, um, this is a really good question. We hear it from uh, several sectors. Uh, I hear it a lot from uh, teachers and from health workers. Okay, uh, They've been uh, uh, working really hard and uh, stretching too thin uh, over the last uh, uh, couple of years. And, uh, uh, and, and they are uh, struggling probably uh, you know, more than uh, other uh, sectors. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, in general, uh, the way to uh, to help people is by uh, changing something in their environment, okay? changing the situation. This is like something that is, is really true for all the behavioral science, that we are thinking about how to change people's situations so that it's easier for them to, uh, to do what they are uh, supposed to do. Uh, and, and one thing that we found that uh, works is asking the people that need help uh, how, how they would change their situation. And often the way we do this is by asking someone who's struggling to give advice to another person who is struggling. So uh, th- this is something that we did with teachers, like asking a, a teacher that had a bad experience to uh, uh, tell another teacher that had a bad experience uh, uh, how to deal with that. Uh, we also ask students, struggling students, uh, uh, what would you advise to another uh, struggling uh, uh, student? Uh, and we ask people that were struggling with their finance or with anger management or with uh, uh, getting a job uh, to give advice to others and and really we got some uh, you know, nice ideas for intervention that we could try but the most important thing uh, was that the person who gave the advice 
uh, was often more motivated as the result of hearing the advice. Uh, so uh, ask uh, uh, the, the people that you are working with, uh, uh, the team, uh, uh, to give the advice and possibly just this exercise of giving the advice is going to help the person who's giving the advice. And on top of it, you're going to get uh, some nice uh, interventions that, uh, that you can use. That's great. Two birds and one stone. I love that. Uh, Talia, I prefer uh, two birds, feed two birds with one scone. I'm vegetarian. <laughs> That's true. Oh. I should have. <laughs> should have the birds. <laughs> feed two birds with one stone. Um, so uh, we have another question about how about the role of habits, doing something because we're just used to doing it without thinking about it. So you, you've spoken about that. But do you want to maybe speak on how best to form a habit? Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, Wendy Wood uh, has a, a really a great uh, line of research, research on uh, uh, forming uh, uh, habits. She also uh, wrote about it in, in a book, A Good Habit, uh, A Bad Habit. Uh, a lot of this is, uh, uh, is practicing, okay, and uh, allowing yourself to, uh, to do something even if it doesn't feel right the first time uh, uh, you do it. Uh, we, we recently ran a, a study with a, a second city improvisation club here in Chicago, uh, where we encouraged the students in their first class to feel uncomfortable. How about your goal is to feel uncomfortable? Uh, and the thing is that if you've never done improv and you're, you're just starting, you will feel uncomfortable. So instead of resist it, embrace it. Okay, This is how it's going to feel until it starts to feel right, okay, and until it starts to feel uh, good. Uh, and so practicing, embracing the discomfort that practicing is going to generate uh, to begin with. And then I would say one more thing is that the, uh, for certain activities, habit uh, uh, is never going to, uh, uh, to be so, like, so much in your mind so that you don't have to think about it, okay? It's never going to be like brushing your teeth. Yeah but it's going to be easier, okay? Uh, for me, exercising is not quite like washing my teeth. I, I need to motivate myself to do it, but it is easier because I kind of have the habit of doing it first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, another question that we have is, is successful completion of a task intrinsically motivating? Is it the essence of the task that is intrinsically motivating? Well, Yes, that, that, to the extent that, um, you know, that you're doing something that achieves the goal as you're doing it, uh, then it is like by definition uh, intrinsic motivation. In a way, achieving a goal is always intrinsically motivating because at that point, the, the goal and the activity are completely fused. Okay? You, you, the reason you're doing something and doing it are uh, completely together. And so to the extent that what you are doing achieves what you were uh, set to do as you're doing it, you will feel highly intrinsically motivated. Yeah, that's a great question. Another question that we have is, are there types of people for, ho for whom uncertainty is motivating and for others for whom it's scary or paralyzing? Yes, and I, I don't, uh, I often don't have a, a lot to say about individual differences uh, beyond uh, you know, what, it, what kind of makes sense, right? That, uh, uh, that every, like everything depends on the person, okay? And uh, uh, the right amount of excitement for you might be different than for me, okay? And uh, the, the uncertainty that feels uh, uh, exciting and, and eliciting of curiosity uh, for me uh, uh, might be uh, much more, much less extreme than, uh, uh, than for you. So yes, we need to tailor these interventions uh, uh, to the person and given that we often try to motivate ourselves, we, we need to think about what what's the level that makes us uh, uh, comfortable. Uh, but maybe another way to, to think about individual differences is that really what 
works for one person is different than what works for another person because they have different barriers. And in my work, I, so I talk about four elements of, of a motivated action. First, you need to set a goal, then you need to sustain your motivation that is monitoring progress when you get from here to there. The, the third element is dealing with everything else in your life. So all the multiple goals that you have. And, and the fourth element is leveraging social support. So when we think about individual differences, you know, Tali, you might be uh, just juggling too many things and I might need uh, more social support, okay? And so giving you social support might not be helpful because you might already feel supported. It's just that you have many goals and they are not going well uh, together. Uh, whereas uh, uh, helping me uh, uh, juggle uh, uh, multiple goals might not be helpful because I really need social support. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's true. Like taking this book and its principles and really getting to know what your needs are and how you can satisfy those given, given that you know yourself best, right? Um, We have a question here of, do you have any tips for limiting social media use, which can be so addictive these days? I'm with you, Diana. (laughs) I. Yes, uh, uh, so there is a lot, of, a lot that has been written on uh, uh, social media, and, and one of the problems with uh, uh, social media is that uh, uh, the designers of social media uh, try to uh, uh, make it addictive, right? So they are uh, uh, trying to make it uh, as such that it will be hard to uh, uh, resist. Uh, so self-control would be uh, helpful. Uh, Also, one thing that uh, you you might want to keep in mind is that uh, avoidance uh, uh, goals are are hard to pursue, okay? Do not, uh, goals are hard, like do not use social media. Uh, It's like, uh, you know, uh, Daniel Wagner's old study, don't think about white bears. Well, once I told you not to think about white bears, can you think about anything else? Okay, so now once I ask you uh, uh, not to think about social media, not to use social media, then how do you know that you are not doing it? Well, you ask yourself, do I think, do I check social media? And by the the fact that you are checking yourself, you are bringing this uh, to mind. Uh, And so uh, avoidance goals are harder than approach goals, which means that if you can find something else that you want to do instead and frame your goal more in terms of now going back to uh, uh, Tali's uh, initial goal, being in the moment, being in the present, mm-hmm. okay? And, and I think, Tali, you refer to being in the present in terms of time. Yes. You would move it to activity, okay? Like when I'm in a conversation, be in that conversation, okay? When uh-huh. I'm with my child, be with the child, okay? And not somewhere else in uh, right. on social media. Uh, that might be an easier goal to adhere to. Right. The goal of connecting with people that we are actually engaging with rather than people on our phone through social media. Yeah. Um, Thank you for that. We also have a question of what are your favorite meta decision rules in your own life? So we're getting personal here. (laughs) What what, what does it mean? Uh, Tali, can you answer this? So I will get an idea of what the question means. So Diana, why don't, because I see Diana is active in the chat. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit more about what you meant about meta decision rules? And while she's doing that, I will move on to another question. Let, let me try and let's okay. see how we feel this. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but one thing that I think is a meta decision will for me is to uh, uh, do uh, uh, what is high priority and not necessarily what's urgent. Okay, And so uh, uh, I, I recently talked to someone who uh, uh, was talking to me about the one minute rule and the one minute rule is that you should, everything that takes less than one minute, you should do it at that moment. And I think that if I lived my life like that, I would spend 1% of the time answering emails because yeah. they take less than one minute each, uh, but they are uh, not my priorities in life. Yeah. So I, I, I do believe that that's what, what Diana meant. And Diana, if that's not what you meant, please let us know in the chat. Uh, another question that we have is, 
That is helpful, she said. Yeah. And inspiring, I have to say, because I busy work is, is urgent work is something you really gravitate towards and, and prioritizing what's important to you is and doing that first is, is less not as easy to do for many people, I find. Um, so another question that we have is can motivation, ooh, I love this question. Okay. Can motivation be a bad thing? How do you manage not encouraging burnout or knowing when maybe it is necessary to take that temptation? How do you balance motivation and stress? So a lot of questions in, in one. Um, so I, I start my book uh, uh, with uh, uh, the story of a group of people that uh, was uh, uh, trying to get to the uh, summit of Mount Everest. Uh, they actually uh, made it, uh, except they did make it back. Uh, and I uh, use this example to illustrate the power of goals. Getting to the top of, uh, of Mount Everest is, uh, uh, is, is a great goal. Okay? It's, it's specific. It's, uh, it's intrinsically uh, motivating. Um, it's really easy to know whether you have reached it. Uh, uh, it's also a goal. It's not a means to a goal. You don't do it because you, you want to train for another uh, mountain. So, so really like a great example for a highly motivating goal, but it was a, a really bad idea for the uh, mountaineers that were attempting to do that um, when the, the weather was bad and they were just not sufficiently flexible in uh, uh, changing uh, uh, their uh, goal. It, it turned out that getting to the summit is, uh, uh, is easier than getting all the way back down. And so they, they just didn't make it. Um, and, and this is just an example for many goals that might be motivating, but they are wrong for us, like extreme sports or extreme diet or uh, uh, sticking to a relationship that, uh, uh, that doesn't work for you or, you know, um, uh, many goals that, that you might choose and, and need to be uh, revised. And, and just by the fact that we can motivate ourselves to, to do something, it doesn't always mean that we should. Right. And we should juggle the goal of just simply staying alive. <laughs> that could be an important goal in that example uh, that they neglected to do. Uh, another question for you is how do you motivate one, one for longer duration outcomes? One cookie today versus two tomorrow. Uh, so, so I think that this refers to... Uh, uh, patience and like intertemporal choices, as we call them, like how, yes. how do you get people to go for uh, uh, what's in the future instead of uh, uh, what is uh, uh, now, which by the way, goes against our human nature. Okay, like as, as humans, as you know, actually all animals, uh, uh, we prefer what's immediate. If I can uh, see you uh, uh, today, Tali, it is so much more than if I can see you next month or next year that uh, uh, the idea that I will give up on the opportunity to see you today so that I can see you next month really goes against my uh, human nature. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, when it gets to uh, something like uh, saving for retirement or uh, you know, completing a, a, a long uh, professional training, uh, then we, we do need to do something that will benefit uh, uh, our future self. There are a few interventions. I will mention one, which is to make the decision uh, way in advance. And so to give you an example, if you have to choose between uh, uh, getting uh, uh, $100 uh, now or uh, $120 next month, many people would choose the $100 now. Okay? It's nice to get the money right now. Uh, if you remove the decision, you ask people, do you want $100 in a year or $120 in 13 months, then uh, the vast majority of the people will uh, say that I, I wait uh, 13 months to, to get the larger uh, amount. Now, what, what I did is just postponing the decision. Okay, so just like making the decision way in advance makes it easier to choose the, the two cookies later. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And we're getting another question where very helpful, Professor Fischbach, and look forward to reading your book. I'm wondering whether you could comment on the relative role of fear of not being good enough versus the relative role of temptation versus the feeling of being overwhelmed in getting in the way of our ability to get it done, or whether those are interrelated. 
<laughs> so, so let me see that I can repeat the, the three is uh, uh, being afraid, being oh. tempted. Uh, yeah, so it's a fear of not being good enough, being tempted, and feeling overwhelmed. All these three. Um, yeah, I think that like being being afraid uh, and and feeling overwhelmed are uh, kind of uh, uh, going together. But um, you know, when, when I hear this question, I, I what I hear is a lot of avoidance calls. Is a mm. lot of like I shouldn't be afraid. I shouldn't be tempted. Uh, I I shouldn't worry. And. I would encourage the person who asked the question to uh, to think about what you should do. Yeah. Uh, what, what is on the on, on the approach uh, uh, side, and 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 note that it's often two sides of the same coin. Uh, so let me give you an example. You know, when when I go to work, I can either think that my goal is not to mess up. Okay, and, and, and like not to uh, uh, lose a promotion, not to lose a, a customer and uh, not to get criticized by my uh, boss uh, uh, to, just to, to make sure that I survive. I can also think about my, my goal at work as, uh, um, as, as being excellent, as, as getting a promotion, as uh, getting my uh, boss to, uh, to see the amazing work that I'm uh, uh, doing. And it's often just two ways to to think about pursuing the same goal okay it's like when i when i meet like now i go to a party i meet new people okay my goal could be uh, to make sure that i'm not embarrassing myself uh, or that i am not lonely that i'm not standing there and no one is talking to me or my goal could be to uh, make new friends and meet new people and it, like the behavior will be the same behavior but uh, like the goal could be either approach or uh, avoidance and uh, what we find is that when people think about this in terms of approach, in terms of what they want to do, uh, it is easier, it is more enjoyable, there is more uh, positive mood, more uh, intrinsic uh, motivation. Really, the only benefit of thinking about the, the negatives is that it seems more urgent. Mm. Okay, so like if I use my party example, if you think about your goal as, as not being lonely, uh, then you're probably going to approach someone more quickly. Okay, but you know, after an hour or so, uh, when we look at that uh, stamina, uh, it's uh, uh, the person who has the, the approach goal of meeting new people uh, is going to have a better time and probably meet more people. Right, right. That's very powerful way of looking at, at it. And I think, uh definitely resonates with me personally as well. Another question that you have is, is self-control linked to different identities we have? Can we trigger a stronger self-control, for example, by reminding ourselves of our different identities? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, yeah, Wima Tuatilleri uh, has done a lot of work uh, on uh, uh, the, the role of uh, identity in uh, in goal pursuit and uh, in self-control uh, uh, specifically, uh, often uh, uh, doing something that fits with our identity, whether it's uh, our professional identity or our identity as a, as a family member, uh, you know, as, as a person in the, uh, in the so, uh, society, uh, as an academic for me, is uh, uh, the way to, uh, to motivate us to uh, pursue our goals. And often when something doesn't fit our identity, this is where we, we see a problem. And there is some interesting work uh, on, on healthy eating showing that uh, uh, for certain populations, uh, uh, the notion that you should uh, eat lots of uh, uh, fruits and vegetables is, is not part of their identity. Okay? It's not part of uh, uh, the, the food that they grew up on, uh, the way they perceive their uh, community and having this clash between my desire to eat healthier and what I think of as the, the food that defines my community and like what we eat as, as people, uh, that, uh, uh, that makes it uh, uh, harder. Uh, I would also add that we find that um, 
people care more about doing something that's consistent with their identity when they anticipate to notice and remember uh, what they are doing. So, you know, like when, when you start on something, okay, when your, your attention is fully on, on whatever you are doing, uh, then you, you care that uh, it will reflect your identity. Uh, when uh, it's in the middle, uh, you might uh, assume that you will not quite remember what you did. And, you know, if I don't quite remember, if I don't anticipate that I will remember uh, what I ate or, you know, how I behaved and, you know, how nice I uh, was to other people, uh, then uh, identity uh, is less of a cue uh, for doing the things that we think we ought to do. Right. Right. And, and you have a very fascinating discussion of the middle problem in, in the book. Uh, another question is, what is the biggest reasons people don't stick with their habits? Um, so it, uh, it depends. <laughs> um, I, I would say, so, you know, there are many reasons, but I would say one thing here that I, I I think, uh, think at least this is the, the reason that comes to my mind right now is that we we are often naive to think that, uh, uh, that we found a way to motivate ourselves. We, we did one thing and, and that thing should uh, work forever. Okay. And uh, uh, and motivating yourself, you know, is, is like is treating a, a chronic condition. Okay. Uh, uh, for most of us, let's take exercising. It, it's a chronic condition. We will always uh, need to boost our motivation. And uh, uh, you don't treat a chronic condition with a one-time medicine. Mm. Okay? And, and so the idea that um, you know, you'll say, well, Ayala suggested that I will uh, find an exercise that I like. And so I discovered that uh, Zumba is, is a lot of fun. And now I anticipate that that will carry me forever. Well, I would be very happy if that's going to carry you for the next few months, but uh, uh, then you constantly need to check with yourself and, and see uh, uh, how well you're doing and how else you can uh, uh, motivate yourself. It's so funny that you mentioned that because when you were at Yale, Zumba was my jam and you are right. It is no longer <laughs> what, what motivates me to do exercise. And now it's the ability to watch trash shows on the elliptical machine and who knows what the next phase would be. So that's, that's a great insight about how, you know, uh, our habits can definitely change where, when the goal stays the same, right? Just to be healthy and have, have a good exercise habits. So uh, another question is, does raising the bar motivate people? And is adding uncertainty like raising the bar? Uh, so, well, a uh, high bar motivates people. And when we think about goal setting, uh, we want people to set a goal that is challenging. That is that maybe you have 80% chance of achieving that goal, or maybe you will achieve it 80% of the times that you attempt. Okay, So you might uh, uh, set your exercises uh, you know, uh, your exercise goal is uh, uh, four workouts uh, uh, this week where realistically you are lucky if you get to four, it's more likely that you will have three. Uh, and so uh, um, challenge is, is good and it's motivating. And the problem with goals that are not challenging is that once we meet them, we disengage with the goal, okay? If, if you want to be realistic, then you might set your exercise goal to two times per week. And then once you achieve it, you, you are not going to move your body for the rest of the week. Uh, and while challenge is uh, uh, motivating and we often set challenging goals for ourselves and, and for others when we are left to our own devices, by the way, this is one reason why we often set unrealistic deadlines. Okay? Like, you know, I, you know, I, I want to finish it by the end of the week. Uh, it's highly challenging. So I'm going to tell Tali that I will finish it by the end of the week, even though it's not quite realistic. Uh, saying that you need to have healthy relationships with your goals. If the only reason to set the goal was to challenge yourself, okay, um, to, uh, not to set the goal, but to set the specific number on the goal, to set the target, was to challenge yourself, uh, then if you exercise three times out of four, uh, great. Okay, uh, uh, maybe next week you, you'll make it to the fourth time. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, I think we have time for one more question. So let's see. I'll make it count. Ooh, okay. There's so many good questions. I it's so hard to, to pick. Um, please discuss procrastination and how to avoid it. It'd be very helping. <laughs> Uh, so uh, another avoidance questions. Now I want to tell you, if you just choose the avoidance questions. Uh, no, I am actually going by order. <laughs> so maybe they're all clustered together. Uh, yeah, but th this is really important. And so there's so much work on uh, uh, procrastination and uh, and how to deal with this and i would say just one thing which is going back to uh, intrinsic uh, uh, motivation uh, what uh, what can you do that will feel good as you do it that will feel right as uh, uh, as you do it and realize that it might not feel good or might not feel right the first time uh, uh, you do it uh, so you know creating a, a certain uh, a new habit uh, uh, deciding to uh, uh, you know go, go and talk earlier or add a walk to your uh, uh, like uh, uh, day uh, might not feel right the first or second or third time that uh, uh, that you do it but if, if do suspect that it will feel right and it will feel good while you do it, then you have a better chance. The mistake is to set goals that are not intrinsically motivating, believing that my future self will do what's right and not what feels good. This is uh, naive. Okay? Uh, my future self is going to be my present self. And the present self is doing things because they feel good as I do them. And so I should suspect that that is going to also be true for the person I'm going to be tomorrow and uh, next year. Yes. Thank you so much, Ayala. This has been riveting. And I wish we could have covered more of your fantastic book, but luckily you have gifted this uh, to us in the world so we can go, uh, go ahead and, and purchase it to learn more. And uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time and, and, and for sharing your wisdom with us. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks everyone that joined us. Uh, I, you know, I, I hope uh, you enjoyed this hour. I hope you uh, like the book and huge thank you for Tali. Always such a pleasure to spend an hour with you. <laughs>